This is BBC Radio 4. Now, Blanche Girouard hears another story of people who were affected by the NHS contaminated blood scandal. This is Blood Matters. <laughs> In the 1970s and 80s, thousands of people suffering from haemophilia were given a revolutionary blood product, known as Factor VIII, that replaced their missing clotting agent. It changed their lives. But some batches of the wonder drug were contaminated with hepatitis and HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, and some of those infected were babies and young children. The infected batch that I had was dated to 19th of February 1983. I was just coming up to six years old. Over 1,100 of the haemophilia patients infected have since died. Thousands more lives have been devastated. We were children. You have no right to do that. They had no permission to do that to us. I'm Blanche Girouard, and I've followed the NHS blood contamination scandal for years, listening to the stories of the infected and affected as they wait for justice. More than four decades on, they're still waiting. For BBC Radio 4, this is Blood Matters. Episode 2, The Wonder Drug is Poisoned. Did you grow up near here? No. Um, I was born in Portsmouth. Um, in 1971. But this I is Adrian Goodyear. He's now 52 and was diagnosed with haemophilia as a young child. When he was a little boy, he boarded at Lord Mayor Trelaw's College in Alton, Hampshire, a school for children with physical disabilities and for those with haemophilia, which we heard about in episode one. Adrian was at one time a music producer, but he hasn't worked more recently. He's chatty and has an infectious laugh and a hacking cough. So Trelaws had a haemophilia treatment centre, is that right? Yes. And where was that in the school? What was it like? It was... <coughs> sorry. It was at the back of the medical centre, um, which was... So there was a dining hall within the medical centre. So there was a doctor there on call, 24-7, seven days a week. At Trelaws College in the late 1970s and 80s, boys with haemophilia like Adrian were being treated with a new blood clotting product, commonly known as Factor VIII, which was being imported by the NHS from the United States. Before that, British laboratories had produced the same product, but they had been unable to keep up with domestic demand. In 1975, the then Health Secretary David, now Lord Owen, had pledged to make the UK self-sufficient in blood products. However, though the initiative was started, it stalled after David Owen was moved from the Department of Health to the Foreign Office in 1976. Adrian received the new Factor VIII blood product at Trelaws from the age of 10. Am I right in thinking that you actually got gifts from the commercial companies that made yeah. this product? We got gifts, calculator, stylus taxi type, you know, 12 inch pads with a calculator, and a, lots of pens, mugs with the actual product on. Sometimes it would have that manufacturer. But that was kind of in the description, really. That's what Americans do, don't they? They brand things. As far back as 1975, Granada Television's World in Action reported on the dangers of the Factor 8 product that was being made commercially in America and imported by the NHS. The documentary makers discovered that numerous blood donor centres were being set up by pharmaceutical companies in deprived Skid Row areas of major American cities targeting vulnerable people, such as prostitutes, alcoholics and drug users, who would give blood repeatedly for money. Once again, we find ourselves among men at the bottom of American society. But for the first time, we find a donor who is prepared to talk to us. His name is Gary. Why do you come down? I need the money. Do you have a job? No. Why not? Because I can't get employment, I'm on parole. Do the questions that they ask you in there, before you give plasma, do you always ask them truthfully? Are you going to tell them? No. no. no you, know, you, you, you know, yeah, most of the time. <laughs> well, what, what sort of questions wouldn't you answer truthfully? Well, they ask you stuff like, you know, if you've been drinking and stuff like that, you know, the night before, you know, if you've been eating right and all that crap, you know. The previous clotting treatment used in the NHS for haemophilia, cryoprecipitate, had been made from the blood plasma of a single donor. 
The new Factor 8 blood product was made from the pooled blood plasma of tens of thousands of donors. And if any one of those donors had an infectious disease, he or she would immediately contaminate the whole batch. By the early 1980s, reports were circulating both in the US and UK that these same blood products might be carrying the HIV virus too. Exactly what and when ministers, government officials and doctors knew about these risks and how they reacted has been examined by the Infected Blood Public Inquiry that was set up by the government in 2017 and led by the former High Court judge Sir Brian Langstaff. It was in the early 1980s that Adrian Goodyear started to come down with temperatures, night sweats, rashes and swelling in his glands. By then he'd been receiving American Factor 8 at Trelaw's boarding school for two years. Following further tests, Adrian and four other boys were summoned to the doctor's office at the school. It was the spring of 1985 and Adrian was by then 13. There was no parents, no phone calls to parents. No family member, no member of care staff, just medics. Dr Tony Aronstam, the director of Trelaw's Haemophilia Centre, began to speak. The more that he spoke, the more emotional he became. He said that some of us have been infected with HIV AIDS the virus that caused AIDS. He lifted his left hand and went round the room and pointed at us and said, you have, you haven't, you have. You haven't, you have got HIV. And we think you've got two to three years to live. But we'll do our best for you. And which were you? Who had it or didn't have it? I had it, yeah. What did you feel when you heard that? We're all dead, that's what I thought, we're dead. And of those five in the room, how many are alive today? Just me. Um, the other two lads died of AIDS and two died of hepatitis. And it's just me now. Um, when we left the room, there was five more lads to go in after us, which I'll never forget that, because they were the next five. In 1987, Dr Aronstam said, we were trying to treat them, the boys, trying to make them healthy. We added another catastrophe to the disaster they already lived under. More than 120 boys with haemophilia were infected with HIV and hepatitis at Trelaws in the 1970s and 80s. More than 70 have since died. Trelaws College has since expressed its sadness that former pupils were amongst those infected with hepatitis and or HIV from infected blood products. Giving evidence to the Infected Blood Inquiry in 2021, the former headmaster of Trelaws, Alexander McPherson, said that neither he nor members of his teaching staff were involved in medical decisions, nor in giving information to parents or pupils. Andy Evans, whom we heard from in episode one, was also treated with imported factor eight from a very early age. But he wasn't told that he had been infected with HIV until he was 13, when he began showing early signs of AIDS. His mother was the one to break the news. My mum took me out in the car and she pulled up on the country lane and I thought to myself, well, this is weird. And she looked at me and I could see there were tears in her eyes. And she said, you might have heard that there's this virus called HIV and I said well yes I have and she said well your factor 8 has had it and you've become infected and she started to cry uh, I, I didn't really I guess understand the full impact of it I just wanted to comfort my mum. From his medical records Andy now knows precisely when he was infected and that the doctors had been aware of his HIV status long before they'd told his parents. I think the infected batch that I had was dated to 19th of February, 1983. I was just coming up to six years old. When did anyone in your family find out? 
they were probably informed around about 1987. I was 10. Did anyone at any point suggest to your parents that there might be any risk associated with injecting factory? Uh, nobody from the hospital said that to her. To your mum? mum. My dad was generally at work, so it was my mum that dealt with it. And his parents did raise their concerns with the doctors about a possible link between Factor 8 and HIV. And his dad had read something about it in the New Scientist magazine. His mum also asked about it at a meeting with other haemophilia parents and doctors. But on both occasions, they were told there was nothing to worry about. Soon after Andy got the shocking news that he was HIV positive, doctors put him on the first antiretroviral drug on the market, called AZT. I do remember feeling properly sort of sick at school. And then it started to develop a little bit further into the high temperatures, fevers. My immune system was depleting and so any opportunistic infection was, uh, it just leapt on me. Uh, so they'd admit me to the hospital. I'd usually be blue lighted in by ambulance. They'd put me on fluids. They'd put me on intravenous antibiotics. Then there would be the antifungals because candida was forming in the back of my mouth and down my throat. So I couldn't eat anything. It must have been so tough on your parents. I mean, the idea of seeing a child go through what you went through. It, well, yeah, I mean, they, they were told by the doctors. I wasn't told myself, but they were told several times that, you know, the next infection would be my last. At one stage, Andy went down to just six stone in weight, despite being over six feet tall. It wasn't until a new combination therapy for HIV became available in 1996 that Andy's health began slowly improving. Later, he discovered that he'd also been infected with hepatitis C, by that time, Andy was married and had children. The treatment for hepatitis took its toll on everyone. It just changed my relationship with the whole family. I became very anxious, very angry. They started me on antidepressants because at one point I was just having constant panic attacks. I was just in bed for two weeks, not able to get up, just rocking from side to side because I felt so terrible, so anxious. That went on for 12 months. Uh, and by the time I came out of it, I was told by my wife that I was just a completely different person. And it's taken a long time to kind of try and recapture the person that I used to be. I was a horrible person after that treatment, during and after. But luckily, it did the job, and now I'm free of the hepatitis C. Do you think it affected your children seeing you like that? I, I, yeah, I think it really did. I think they, for the first time, they were probably a bit nervous of their dad. Mm. It makes me feel really bad, and, and I really regret having gone through the treatment, even though it's cured me. Next time on Blood Matters, we hear how some patients were kept in the dark by their doctors for years about their HIV-contaminated treatment. And we speak to doctors about how this could have happened. You know, the culture was different then. The doctors were, in a sense, kings. You know, they decided, if you come and see me, I know what's good for you. Blood Matters was presented by Blanche Giroud. The producer was Mike Lanchon, and the series is a CTVC production for Radio 4. And you can find details of organisations that can provide help and support with the issues raised in this programme at bbc.co.uk slash actionline.